This talk is to discuss the current concepts in nerve injury and repair. We'll cover the pathophysiology of nerve injury, how to clinically assess an injured nerve, the role of surgery, and the reconstructive ladder. Seddon's classification still stands the test of time. Neuropraxia, or a conduction block injury, axonotomesis from axonal disruption, and neurotomesis from a functional discontinuity of the nerve due to loss of axons and the supporting structures. Sunderland expanded the classification, breaking down axonotomesis injuries into those involving just axonal injury, those with endoneural injury, and those with perineural injury, supposedly explaining the variable outcome that can occur in neuropraxic injuries. Now, when a nerve conducts electricity, it requires Schwann cells of its large myelinated nerve and a lot of energy. Ischemia can produce a conduction block. Edema can distort the Schwann cell sheath, closing down the nodes of Ronvier and preventing saltatory conduction, and is also a cause of conduction block. Compression can also damage the axon, so the Schwann cell sheath can be disrupted segmentally, causing a conduction block, but if the injuring agent is not removed, then the cell itself can undergo axonal injury. Lundberg's classification tried to explain the different types of neuropraxic injury seen, from the ischemic injury that occurs, edema disrupting the Schwann cell sheath or segmental demyelination. However, this persistent injury such as compression, scar, displaced fracture fragments, this can result in axonal damage. Involution and resorption of the distal uh, axon and then nerve regeneration only if there's physical continuity of ended neural tubes. So the important thing to bear in mind is a conduction block injury, if not recognised promptly, may deteriorate to an axonal injury. The easiest classification is the neurophysiological classification, which breaks down injuries into non-degenerative, i.e. no Wallerian degeneration, and degenerative, where Wallerian degeneration has occurred and the nerve needs to regrow. So this is a comprehensive classification, and it shows the difference between the different types of classification described from Seddon through to Lumburg. Now there are other important factors we need to take into consideration. A mixed peripheral nerve contains a number of different fibres, and those different fibres have different functions, therefore different oxygen demands and different speeds of conduction. So the large fibres, which conduct very quickly, are responsible for somatic motor efferent function, tendal, tendon, uh, organ and spindle, uh, responses, but also some touch and proprioception responses. These require significant amounts of energy, and in order to reduce the energy demand, Schwann cells invest the axon, creating nodes of Ronvier. At these points, the voltage-gated channels are clustered, and the total ATP expended per action potential is therefore reduced. Losing the Schwann sheath can disrupt conduction along segments. The smaller fibres aren't reliant on Schwann cells for conduction, although they are intimately related, as you'll see in this slide. So the different myelinated fibres can be large fibres or small unmyelinated fibres, but they're all associated with Schwann cells to varying or lesser degrees. So large fibres are more likely to be involved in a neuroapraxia injury, and this is when there's either ischemia, edema, or a segmental demyelination it's rare to have any involvement of deep pressure, piloerector, autonomic pseudomotor or vasomotor function. And patients will often have some deep pressure awareness and preserved autonomic nervous function. When all the fibre subtypes are involved, it's usually indicative of an axonopathy and there's usually neuropathic pain, autonomic dysfunction causing dry red skin due to vasodilatation and the loss of the pseudomotor sweating function and there's often a tinel to be found as well. So the degenerative nerve lesion, or the nerve lesion of axonopathy, or pathological degeneration of the nerve, the hallmarks are pain, dry skin with erythema, and a positive tinel sign at the site of injury, causing irritation in the distribution of the nerve. Now when should nerves be explored? Well, nerves should be explored for diagnosis, if there's doubt, for decompression, 
if there are displaced fracture fragments in the line of a nerve that's injured, if there's a delay to reduction of a dislocation, if the patient develops dry skin or neuropathic pain, if there's a disruption of the nerve suspected, or if the patient's deteriorating under observation, or any delay in recovery. Now there are a number of different strategies one can employ for reconstructing nerves, from simple decompression through nerve repair, neurolysis of scar, use of conduits to bridge non-critical nerve gaps, nerve grafts, nerve allograft, nerve transfers and late salvage with tendon transfer arthrodesis or free muscle transfers. The principles of surgery are early surgical assessment of the nerve and optimising the environment for the nerve. And this allows you to define the injury and decompress the nerve, perform any debridement that's necessary and undertake attention-free direct microscopic assisted repair when possible. I consider conduits in short segment defects of less than 12 millimeters in sensory nerves. The evidence beyond this is limited. I graft critical nerves. The gold standard remains reversed sensory autograft, usually the sural nerve from the leg or a cutaneous nerve from the upper limb. And I consider allograft in critical mixed nerves injuries where there's limited donor availability or the patient sensitized with neuropathic pain. And I always consider nerve transfers as an adjunct to a nerve graft in a critical function following a segmental injury to a main nerve trunk. So nerve repair remains a gold standard. However, it's recognised that tension integrity or the uh, natural resting tension within a complete biological structure results in gapping of a nerve following injury. In this particular case, there was some epineurium and one fascicle remaining, which allowed the nerve not to retract, so a relatively tension-free repair could be accomplished. The benefits of direct repair with one neurography versus putting in short gap graphs to decrease tension with two neurophies where there can be axonal loss need to be weighed every time. So this is a diagram demonstrating a peripheral nerve and if that section there's distal Wallerian degeneration, the yellow is representing axons which need to grow from the left of the screen to the right. And if one looks at the cross-sectional anatomy of the nerve at this point, the fascicular architecture looks very similar and the axons you can see here are scattered for a key distal motor function throughout several of the fascicles. It's simply sufficient to perform an epineural approximation repair with a small gap of a millimeter or less with no infolding of the endoneural tubes. This will allow the nerves to regenerate across the neurography. However, in cases where a motor branch point is exiting the nerve, if the injury occurs at this site, what you can see is that although the architecture is similar, the motor fascicles to a key function downstream are all concentrated within one or two fascicles going to that motor endpoint. And therefore, at this point, one should consider an epiperineural or a group fascicular repair in order to align the key motor fascicles. An example of this would be the ulnar nerve just above the wrist, where the motor and the sensory fascicles have already started to separate five centimetres above the wrist, the dorsal branch of the ulnar nerve, then the motor fascicle, then the main superficial sensory nerve lie in close approximation. And it's important to get the accurate anatomical reduction and suture of those fascicle groups so that the function is preserved downstream. The rest of the nerve can either be repaired with a group fascicular repair or an epineural repair. And this allows the motor axons to regenerate down the target. Now the gold standard remains nerve repair with a microscope and this is for a nerve without a gap. Here simply placed sutures can be graded and the quality of the repair can be assessed. I prefer to use magnification using a microscope and it's interesting to note that when one undertakes loop magnification repair and then looks at the repair under the microscope you'll often find that the anastomosis uh, is rarely excellent. Uh, it may be good but generally is fair. So one of the options we have is to prevent axonal escape at a repair site and minimising sutures. So a nerve can be sutured and then a connector or a conduit, in this case this is an axogard connector, can be placed around the nerve and sutured remotely. And this can detention the repair site. It may prevent axonal escape and it may prevent scar tether at the site of neurography and judiciously placed sutures could reduce the total number of sutures needed at the nerve anastomosis site.
therefore reducing fascicular distortion and scar. It remains to be seen whether connector-assisted repair without sutures at the neurography confer advantages or not, and this is something that we're trialling at the moment. Previous studies have looked at this, including uh, one of the papers uh, by Birkstein looking at the median and ulnar nerves in the forearm. Uh, however, there were significant gaps that were left. Now, when there's damage to a nerve, it's important to debride the nerve. As one debrides the nerve, we create a gap. But it's very important to consider that the debridement is adequate. If there's a failure to debride back to fascicular structure, then inevitably the outcome will be compromised. But by debriding back, we may end up in a situation where the gap is longer, and we know that long gaps beyond five or six centimetres do very poorly, and we may, of course, be limited by our donor sural nerve. If it's a small gap in a non-critical digital nerve, it's possible to bridge this. So this is not a border digit in a small gap of perhaps uh, 5 to 12 millimetres, could just be bridged quite comfortably, and this can result in reasonable functional recovery. However, larger gaps and gaps in critical nerves gen tend to be bridged using cables of autologous sural nerve. Now, the sural nerve has lower endoneural tube density than the parent mixed motor and sensory nerve that's being grafted, and all this connective tissue provides a barrier to scar. But the sural nerve, by use of cables, can revascularize well. Large main nerve trunks, if they're used, end up with necrosis at the center and don't get populated readily by Schwann cells from the host. And this is one of the problems when using um, allograft. So reverse sural cables placed in a gap within the ulnar nerve are some five to six centimeters, loosely approximated. But the most important consideration is here, as soon as one creates a gap in a nerve, no longer do the fascicles represent each other anatomically. And this is because there is constant interfascicular branching. So it's not possible to anatomically directly repair fascicle group to fascicle group. And this is where processed allograft has been used just to provide a scaffold for axonal uh, regrowth. Now one of the problems about using autologous donor nerve, such as a sural nerve, the may, patient may need to have a general anaesthetic, might need to be repositioning a second scrub team, longer operation, risk of deep feet vein thrombosis, may need an overnight stay. So I do use the sural nerve where I need lots of length and sometimes I use both arms and sometimes one of the sorry both legs and one of the arms in patients with a severe brachial plexus injury where we may use medial cutaneous nerve of arm and forearm plus the superficial radial nerve if we're reconstructing a lot of the brachial plexus however for short gaps in the upper limb i'm reluctant to use the sural nerve because of the morbidity this is just an example of the painful symptomatic sural nerve neuroma that prevented this gentleman driving for four years and this had been for a two centimeter reconstruction of a common digital nerve. Now the advanced nerve allograft is processed human nerve tissue and it's prepared in such a way that it's between branch points and toxic uh, proteins within the uh, basement membrane that prevent axonal regrowth or enzymatically depleted as is cellular material and it comes frozen with a shelf life of a couple of years and it comes in a variety of sizes and can be trimmed to size so one doesn't need to compromise on uh, the debridement. This is a case of a patient who's already had a brachial plexus reconstruction um, three months after polytrauma for a lateral cord uh, but a lateral head of the median nerve was not conducting and he had an injury to the forearm with open fracture of the radius uh, and the ulna and unfortunately, it had not been recognised that he had also got an injury to the median nerve at this point. Uh, we had to delay exposure because of the delayed union of the plates and the risk of infection while we were letting the soft tissue settle down. But surgical grafting was undertaken at six months and there was obviously a neuroma established at the proximal end and the distal end obviously has swelling from gliosis. Once this is debrided, and I use neurotomes, it's possible to measure a allograft. In this case, we took a seven centimeter uh, by four to five millimeter allograft, and we just trimmed it to size, leaving a six and a half centimeter allograft in place. 
uh, that was tension free with the wrist in extension. So there's no donor morbidity and the technique can be done with isolated limb anesthesia. The benefit of this technique is debriding the nerve to the size one needs, not compromising on the debridement, but they are expensive. The question is whether longer lengths perform as well, and this is subject to a registry study, and larger dimensions um, than the four to five uh, can end up with poor revascularization and central necrosis and scar. So currently a 70 millimeter by four to five millimeter diameter is the largest that's been uh, marketed and monitored in registry studies. So my personal view of allografts as of 2017, I undertake a significant number of nerve graft reconstructions, but the nerve allograft I reserve for complex cases with failed primary surgery, limited autograft, a long-standing painful nerve defect and anticipated poor outcome, patient choice, a refusal to set, uh, accept an autologous graft, or if a patient's exquisitely sensitised from neuropathic pain where I'm reluctant to give them a second nerve injury site to harvest the donor nerve. Here are a few cases. So this is a patient having a salvage reconstruction for a failed critical digital nerve repair to the on the digital nerve of the thumb using a small allograft. And this is a patient with a atrogenous injury to the common digital nerves uh, take off from the median nerve at the time of carpal tunnel surgery, delayed referral to us, established neuromas and sensitization, and so we undertook allograft reconstruction. This is another very large gap in a patient who's got an extensive lower limb injury with no donors available with frames on both legs, and therefore we decided to use uh, an autograft in order to try and bring sensation back to an anaesthetic foot. In this particular case, the length of the gap was such that we needed to buddy two allografts to each other, so creating a triple neurography, which could be a further barrier to successful renovation. Now, a word on grafting and a word on repair. This is a blast injury with a brachial artery reconstruction, a median nerve graft, and an ulnar nerve transposition and direct repair. The ulnar nerve was slow to recover after a tension repair with transposition but the ultimate function was much greater in the ulnar nerve than in the median nerve where a tension free graft was used to reconstruct the nerve and this is probably the factor of using mixed motor and sensory nerve reconstruction with grafting uh, resulting in poor axonal regeneration and axonal misdirection so following the graft interposition nerves will regenerate and some will get held up at the first or the second neurography and some nerves that actually cross both neurorophies will be non-functional because a motor may end up in a sensory endoneural tube or vice versa. And this is even despite neurotropism and neurotrophism. So the net effect is very few nerves regenerate. And for a successful re-innovation, for instance for a motor nerve, we also need to have an afferent pathway for a stretch receptor or a Golgi spindle, a spindle apparatus in order to give control. And so it's no wonder that in these major mixed nerve trunk injuries where there are multiple different subfiber types that the functional outcomes are poor. So my principles of nerve surgery include that when I'm grafting, I consider allograft, but I also consider nerve transfers. Nerve transfers should be for critical functions. They can be done for non-reconstructable lesions such as brachial plexus avulsions of roots, they can be done if the bed for surgical reconstruction with a graft is poor. As a, if there's a proximal lesion, such as a very high ulnar nerve lesion, I will undertake a distal targeted uh, hemi end-to-end -end nerve transfer for intrinsic ulnar nerve function. They can be used as a critical function adjunct to a mixed nerve graft if a patient presents late or if your primary surgery has failed. And also can be useful if there's insufficient autologous graft available. Now sometimes it's not possible to undertake nerve transfers when there are multiple nerve roots injured. Nerve transfer results on having some intact neural pathways that can be used. So it's ideal in the partial plexus injury, but isn't of much use when someone has a total plexus avulsion injury such as this. In such cases, extraplexal donors such as contralateral pectoral nerves 
spinal accessory nerve, phrenic or inter intercostal nerves could be used, but the functional gains are obviously limited by the significant motor loss and the few donors available. So the principles of nerve transfer, so the intact nerve above is conducting electricity, the muscle below is supplied by the red nerve which is non-functioning, so we section a fascicle or a motor branch from the intact nerve, in this case a fascicle, and we transfer that onto the motor branch target close to the end plate so that re distances are short and the muscle can re successfully. So here's a couple of demonstrations just to show how we would use this in practice. So for a very high ulnar nerve lesion at the elbow, I would undertake a synchronous surgical Martin Gruber anastomosis using an anterior interosseous nerve augmentation. So here's the anatomy. The ulnar nerve is injured at the elbow region. The pisiform is shown at the wrist crease. And the ulnar nerve has a motor fascicle sandwiched between the dorsal branch of the ulnar nerve and the main sensory fascicle, which is slightly larger than the motor fascicle. And it's in this junction between the two that the motor fascicle will be identified. So the nerve can be debrided at the elbow and it can be repaired, in this case with a transposition to gain length. I undertake an FDP tenodesis so that the patient can restore hand grip function within two or three weeks of surgery. And if the surgery is performed early, I would do some stimulation just to confirm motor and sensory fascicles. It must be remembered that clinical examination is critical. If there is no intrinsic function, but the patient is less than seven days from injury, then this interruptive stimulation can be used to target the motor fascicle. If the patient's more than seven days, then obviously Wallerian degeneration will have occurred and it's not possible to stimulate. If the patient has any motor function preserved within the intrinsics, and this technique should not be performed as they will have a, an anatomical Martin Gruber anastomosis already, and this technique is not necessary. What we do is we map the target fascicle and we split the target motor fascicle. And this is, in this case, the two yellow groups are sensory nerves. The motor fascicle is then split, and one fascicle is selected that fascicle showing on stimulation all intrinsic function and then we harvest then we harvest the anterior interosseous nerve and we use that to anastomose end to end onto one of the fascicles of the deep branch of the ulnar nerve reinnovation can now occur from the repair site but a faster reinnovation is possible directly into this end to end anastomosis to achieve some motor functional preservation in advance of the regenerating nerve front from the elbow. This is another case to illustrate the use of allograft. So in this particular case, this patient has had an atrogenic injury to the posterior interosseous nerve. The nerve has a neuroma in continuity in the superficial radial nerve. The yellow sloop is the branch to ECRB and the main superficial radial nerve and the red sloop is proximally around the main radial nerve trunk before the posterior interosseous nerve branches. Here the posterior interosseous nerve is identified and supinator is released to show division of the posterior interosseous nerve. And on this short video it's possible to see the radial head and the capsule that's been debrided together with the damage to the posterior interosseous nerve and to the main radial nerve trunk. So in this case, what I've done is I've taken the ECRB branch and transferred that onto the posterior interosseous nerve and grafted that directly so motor becomes motor and sensory sensory rather than risk no motor re of the critical ECRB because of the huge number of sensory axons that are coming down through the grafted or allografted segment of the superficial radial nerve. Tisil can be used to secure the neurorophies. So the surgical techniques that are available to us. Decompression should be done early after surgery. Neurolysis is to release scar later. Repair can only be done early. After that there's a gap after debridement requiring grafting. Grafting can only be done up to around six months to nine months. The results are limited in terms of efficacy unless it's a pure sensory nerve after this stage. Nerve transfer can be done at any time up to about nine months so long as the transfer is performed close to the target motor function. Sensory transfers can be performed later and salvage with tendon transfers and arthrodesis are performed much later on. 
So there are a number of different strategies that can be employed. Patients may still require surgery with conduction block injuries to decompress the nerve if there's doubt or if there's a deepening lesion under observation. Axonal injuries, generally if they're low grade, require no surgery, but if they're more severe, may require neurolysis. Very severe axonal injuries res result in the same outcome as a neurotomesis with an endurema or a neuroma in continuity, and these require excision and grafting. Please check out our website for further information.